On the 19th of June 2006, paranormal investigator Darren Ritson became involved in an unsettling case. A mother was seeking help for her daughter, a woman in her twenties with a three-year-old son who was said to be in danger. The threat was, so the older lady told the investigator, a dark force that lingered in her daughter's home frightening her, moving objects, even pieces of furniture, seemingly fixated on her son. She is very frightened, the woman wrote in an email to Ritson, and is willing to get any help possible. After all, the daughter, Marianne, wasn't the only one to experience the activity. Her partner, Mark, had also experienced the strangeness, including hearing a voice on the baby monitor saying that Robert, their three-year-old son, was going to fall out of bed. On another occasion, one of the boy's toys, a large cuddly rabbit, was even found moved. Sitting in a blue plastic chair at the top of the stairs, a razor-sharp box cutter blade in its hand. It was inexplicable and chilling, and given that the activity had by that point been going on since the previous year, demanded attention. And so Ritson and his friend and fellow investigator Michael Hallowell offered to help in whatever way that they could, pledging that they would not walk away until the family's invisible intruder was gone. What came next was months of struggle, further and increasing paranormal activity, and even physical injury, all of which has resulted in this case, now known as the South Shields Poltergeist, being lauded as one of the most remarkable British poltergeist cases thus reported in the 21st century. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. Poltergeists are often thought of as having fixations. Rather than haunting a home, they, it can be said, haunt individuals, specifically one person within a location, focusing their energy in a way that arguably resembles addiction. Repeated habits, like moving the same or similar objects time and time again, even habitually sticking to one part of the building. In many ways, they act similarly to many of us with our bad habits. And so, before we dive too deep into this case, I would like to take a quick moment to discuss how you can break your bad habits and thus thank the sponsor of today's video, Fume. Fume is an innovative and award-nominated device that uses plants and behavioural science to help you swap your negative habit for a positive one. Instead of vapour or chemicals, Fume uses non-addictive cores infused with delicious aromatherapy-grade essential oils, including sweet orange and peppermint, to flavour the air as you breathe through your fume. In many ways, this diffusive device is no different than a diffuser that sits on your nightstand or in your bathroom, releasing natural scent into the air over time. I myself love essential oils and really find that their scents help to de-stress me, and so can really appreciate the thought that went into Fume's design. Not only that, Fume is really big on science, with lots of studies linked to from their website, as well as explanations on how behavioural science works. In addition to this, Fume has been carefully designed to look stylish with real wood and a sleek adjustable airflow dial, as well as having moving parts and magnets for fidgeting. In short, Fume gives your fingers something positive to fix on instead of negative. Fume has recently released new cores, including orange vanilla and sparkling grapefruit, which contains one of my all-time favourite all-natural essential oils, Lang Lang, a soothing and floral scent renowned for alleviating anxieties. Switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable and fun. Fume has served over 100,000 customers and has thousands of success stories. There's no reason that can't be you. And so join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com forward slash parascholar or scan the QR code and use code parascholar to get 10% off when you get the journey pack today. And so that's tryfum.com and use code PARASCHOLAR to save an additional 10% off your order today. Thank you for listening and thus helping to support my channel. Now on with the video and a case of spooky supernatural fixation. By the time Ritson and Hallowell became involved in the case, Marianne Peterworth, her partner Mark, and her young son Robert had already been living with paranormal chaos for several months. Starting in December 2005, the activity was at first subtle. 
small objects appeared in odd locations around their North England home. The front door, locked the night before, would be found open in the morning. To begin with, Marianne and Mark blamed the occurrences on each other, small acts that were easy to attribute to each other's forgetfulness. However, as the months progressed, the activity increased, until by the summer of 2006, there was no denying something strange was going on in the Peterworth house. Not only that, it seemed fascinated by Marianne's little boy. A well-mannered and cheery child, Robert told his mother that he had an invisible friend called Sammy, with whom he played in his bedroom. Of course, at only three years old, this was nothing unusual, and yet, given the strange activity in the house, Marianne began to wonder whether or not what her son was telling her was more than a simple, childish, imaginary friend. After all, not only did objects in his room move, for example, the constant and mysterious relocation of his little plastic table and chair, they were also thrown. In particular, small items, including toy cars and a yellow plastic nut from a toy workbench, were said to have been thrown regularly, catapulted by unseen hands so as to ricochet off walls and doors into Marianne. There were even reports of solid-through-solid -solid interactions, where objects, including a cup, were said to have been thrown through solid surfaces, such as a closed window. Then, there were the more sinister happenings. Robert's toys were not merely found moved, but arranged in unusual ways. For example, a cuddly rabbit was discovered with a box cutter blade resting on its paw, a sharp and dangerous item that was not previously anywhere near Robert's toys. On another occasion, the boy's rocking horse, an item that had been mysteriously relocated multiple times before, was even found hanging from the loft hatch by its reins. Discovered by Marianne's brother Ian, the offending toy was said to have been subsequently banished from the house, left outside in the garden overnight. The next morning, it was back indoors. No one had moved it, and yet there it was. After that, the family destroyed it. And so it was that in June 2006, the Peterworth house was in crisis. Not merely had the activity been going on for six months, been observed by Marianne and Mark, as well as by visitors to their home, including brother Ian and mother June, it was also said to have escalated dramatically in recent weeks. And whilst Robert had thus far escaped injury, Marianne and Mark were both becoming increasingly concerned, not merely for their son's safety, but for their own as well. After all, in addition to having toy cars and other objects launched at them by unseen hands, they also reported being hit by an invisible force on multiple occasions. Mark had even, so the couple claimed, been pushed over, with large objects including stepladders having fallen onto him, seemingly pushed when they were otherwise securely resting against a wall. In this way, when Darren Ritson first got into contact with Marianne, it was clear to him that the household was experiencing symptoms commonly associated with poltergeist activity. Having been interested in the paranormal from a young age, after an adolescent experience in France when a bedside cabinet supposedly rocked from side to side, and then, inexplicably, threw itself across the room, Ritson was by that point well-read in all things poltergeist, and had something of a local reputation for being a paranormal investigator. Because of this, Ritson counselled Marianne over the phone to remain calm and try to document all of the happenings. Poltergeist activity, so he told her, was usually short-lived, and given that the family had already been experiencing strangeness since December, it would most likely burn itself out sometime soon. And yet, contrary to Ritson's initial assessment, this was not the case at all. Rather, the activity continued to escalate, with the reports which Marianne sent the investigator becoming more and more sensational. Reading the book which Ritson later wrote on the South Shields case, Marianne's diary of activity reveals that a white figure was seen in the bedroom on the 3rd of July. On the 9th, all manner of objects were reported as being thrown or moved, including a heavy chest of drawers. Chillingly, a message was even discovered on one of Robert's childish doodle boards the same day. It read, 
die, and could have only been written, so the mother claimed, by someone other than herself, her partner, or her son. The next day, Marianne invited a priest to come and bless her home. This seemed to stop the activity for a few days. However, by the 13th, the strangeness had resumed, and appeared to be, room by room, taking over the entire house. Chairs were moved in the dining room, even so Marianne claimed, while she was sitting on them. Later that same day, at around 10.30pm, the chest of drawers was moved yet again. Tipped over onto Robert's bed, the little boy tucked up asleep inside of it. Fortunately, the child was uninjured. However, such an act of violence led the couple to abandon the house. That night, they stayed with parents. As they fled, an old bed frame, outside and resting against a wall, is said to have fallen onto Mark, causing him injury. Almost a month since Ritson had first been made aware of the case, it was now time for him to visit the Peterworth house and see the happenings for himself. After all, the activity did not seem to be lessening. If anything, it was getting worse, and the family, by their own admission, were desperate for help. Their well-being, and most importantly, the well-being of a three-year-old child, was at risk. Writing in his book, Ritson is clear to state that he was by no means entirely accepting of the claims presented to him by Marianne and her family. Whilst he had experienced the paranormal for himself, and was therefore generally believing of its existence, he could not exclude the possibility of fraud, either intentional or otherwise. Indeed, he knew of other cases in which allegedly poltergeist-plagued individuals had falsified claims for attention, and whilst there was nothing on the surface, at least, to suggest this in terms of the Peterworth case, he would only be satisfied as to the reality of the happenings if he was able to experience them for himself. And so it was that on a hot July day, he and fellow paranormal investigator Michael Hallowell travelled to 42 Lock Street, South Shields, so as to interview Marianne and Mark and, as he states in his book, carry out some preliminary investigations. Knowing how rare genuine paranormal activity can be, he did not, in all honesty, expect to experience anything on his first visit to the house. And yet, within just a few minutes of heading upstairs to Robert's bedroom, both Ritson and Hallowell were said to have been exposed to all manner of paranormal oddities. Sudden drops in temperature, subtle, light shimmering movements, and unsettling, one of the plastic nuts on Robert's toy workbench being launched across the room with such force that it made a cracking sound when it struck Marianne's side. As Ritson explains in his book, Someone, or something, had apparently thrown the nut with great force from the northwesterly corner of Robert's bedroom. The nut had travelled with such velocity that it bounced off the door and hit Marianne on the buttock, before eventually dropping to the floor. Given that no one was standing in the northwesterly corner of the room, both investigators were flabbergasted. And yet, as time went by, this incident would be remembered as one of the lesser things to have happened in the South Shields house. As has been said previously, much of the activity seemed to focus on the bedroom of three-year-old Robert. In many ways, it can be said that his bedroom became a veritable circus of paranormal activity. In addition to objects being moved and thrown, Robert himself was eventually found relocated as well, on more than one occasion. A nightmare scenario for any mother, Marianne was horrified when, on the 17th of July, she first discovered her child had been removed from his bed. As recorded in Ritson's book, the family had experienced activity in the house all day. Small objects being pushed over, even transported through closed windows to be thrown out into the garden. Mark even reported being locked inside the toilet, unable to open the door, it being pressured by an unseen force on the other side. It was in the evening, however, that the activity climaxed. It was almost 9pm, and fearing that the happenings were getting out of hand, Mark and Marianne again decided to spend the night away from the home and so went upstairs to wake a sleeping Robert so as to get him dressed and ready to leave. And yet, when they walked into his room, he was no longer in bed. 
Instead, he was on the floor, tightly swaddled in his quilt, his little plastic table on top of him, its legs pinning him in place, thereby making it impossible for the little boy to move. Rushing to her son, Marianne freed him, before turning him over to check that he was alright. It was then that she realised he was still asleep, but with his eyes wide open. It was as if he was in some sort of trance, she later explained. Holding him to her, it supposedly took some time for the little boy to rouse and return to normal consciousness. On a separate occasion, Robert was again moved. This time, his whereabouts wasn't immediately clear to the couple. After a long and frantic search of the house, he was found in one of the wardrobes in the master bedroom, once more constricted, tightly cocooned in a blanket, fast asleep. How he had got there was utterly inexplicable. Then there were the unsettling messages. Written on Robert's magnetic drawing boards, they told the reader to die, and later, just go now. There were also less clear messages, such as a repeated C and U, quite possibly a phonetic text-speak CU, the so-called poltergeist attempt at letting the family know that they were being watched in their home at all times. For certainly, much of the activity reported by Marianne, her family, and the investigators was of an intimidatory nature. Continuing the theme of Robert's toys being interacted with, on one chilling occasion, several cuddly toys were said to have been found hanging from a shelf in Robert's room, with one, the figure of a policeman, having been hung by a cord wrapped tightly around his neck. Marianne was said to have been left distraught by the discovery. After all, there was no way that three-year-old Robert could have done it. Later, the same toy was discovered with its head torn off. Other sensational activity recorded by the paranormal investigators included the power tripping off in the house, coins apporting in mid-air, perhaps even falling through the ceiling from the upstairs, a strange red liquid, quite possibly blood, appearing in the toilet instead of clean water when it was flushed, a mysterious patch of urine-smelling liquid that seemed to manifest in the middle of Robert's bedroom carpet when the boy was absent from the house, and even loud, weird giggling coming from Robert's bedroom, heard by Marianne through the floor when she was downstairs. In all of this, Darren Ritson was astonished. He knew that what he was experiencing, witnessing with his own eyes, was incredible and rare and also utterly inexplicable. Despite repeatedly telling the family that their troubles would soon be over, had to be over soon, the activity seemed to have no intention of stopping. Speaking in an interview about the case 15 years later, Ritson even expressed how the South Shields poltergeist triggered something of a personal crisis in him. He was, he explained, dealing with something completely unknown, and could see how vicious and cunning and evil it could be. It felt like it would never end, and led him to wonder what he had got involved in. All we could do, he explained, was reassure the family, and tell them it would eventually end. And yet, when the sinister messages, at first written on Robert's doodle boards, began to be sent via text message to Marianne's mobile phone and even the house's landline, he couldn't help but wonder if it ever would. The first odd texts said to have been received were relatively tame. Sent to the house's landline, one was, as was the case in 2006, read aloud by the phone's automated robotic voice. Hi, it said. Hi, 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 hi. Oddly, it had been sent from Mark's mobile phone, which was on the dining table in front of all present, untouched at the time. Determined to eliminate the possibility of fraud, Ritson and Hallowell asked everyone to remove their phones from their pockets and place them on the table beside Mark's. Still, the messages continued to be sent. Hello, hello, and then, a few moments later, sorry. The investigators even removed the battery and SIM card from Mark's phone. Regardless, the messages still came. As the days and weeks passed, the telephonic messages, seemingly sent by whatever was in the house, continued. Marianne received them directly to her mobile phone, and Mark, when away from the house, would receive calls from the landline. Whenever he answered, the line would be dead. With no one in the house, this was considered impossible. 
it was chilling, especially given how the messages not only increased in frequency, but also in aggression. Going to die today. Going to get you, one read, sent to Marianne from Mark's inactive phone. Another threatened, I can get you when awake, and I'll come for you when you're asleep. When Marianne considered leaving the house so as to spend the night with her mother, the poltergeist seemingly intercepted by texting, please don't go, I will come with you. Even when the phones were not in use, and in some cases disabled through the removal of their power source, the messages continued to be sent. On one occasion, a friend of the young mother even alleged to have received a message, seemingly from Marianne's phone, stating, I am going to kill you. I am coming soon. Investigator Darren Ritson was present in the house at the time, and has testified that Marianne had absolutely not sent the message ascribed to her phone. And indeed, why would she want to? She was utterly terrified by what was going on in her home. The receipt of threatening text messages can be said to have marked a shift in the activity in the South Shields house. Previously a nuisance, in terms of objects being moved, the entity, or whatever it was, now seemed determined to hurt the family physically. In addition to little Robert being relocated, his bedroom was utterly trashed on numerous occasions. A chest of drawers was thrown, his bed was dragged into the middle of the room, and his little plastic table was mysteriously warped as if exposed to a high temperature. Appropriately terrifying noises, thumps, and even the sound of footsteps stomping back and forth across the room are said to have accompanied the activity. Each time Marianne, as was increasingly her habit, phoned the investigators, desperate for help. Voices are also said to have been heard, both through the baby monitor Marianne used to listen out for her son when she was downstairs, and also eerily from the loft. Both a whispering female voice and an inaudible, deep male voice were said to have been heard. Who they were, or what their purpose, is anyone's guess. The family even reported kitchen knives being thrown by unseen hands around the house, especially at Marianne, with some said to have only narrowly missed her. In a 2021 article, the investigator Darren Ritson even detailed how, on one occasion, he found a large silver knife lying in situ on Robert's bedroom floor, and it was certainly not there previously. If indeed moved there by the so-called poltergeist, it is difficult to draw any other conclusion than one of sinister intention. The most incredible and ominous of all the activity reported, however, can be said to be the physical violence experienced by Mark. Said to have happened multiple times after the activity escalated, he reported feeling a peculiar burning sensation on his body, which, when inspected by lifting up his shirt, was found to be the result of red rashes, scratches and cuts that were not there previously. Indeed, not only were they fresh, they, so those who witnessed them have attested, appeared to develop on his skin as if he was still in the midst of an attack. The first time this happened, he was in bed, trying to sleep. Another time, an alleged attack was witnessed by investigator Michael Hallowell, with video footage said to have been gathered. A later, even more vicious paranormal assault was witnessed by an even larger gathering of investigators and friends who had come to the Peterworth residence in an attempt to flush out the entity and thus relieve the couple. On that occasion, so Darren Ritson recalls, 11 people were there to witness it, and four of them had good quality video cameras so as to film the attack as it occurred. Nothing short of brutal blood was drawn, with Mark's skin left in tatters. And yet, it was utterly and inexplicably healed within 48 hours. All in all, it is asserted that Mark was physically attacked by the poltergeist five times. As Ritson has explained, the strength and ability of this entity seemed to grow bigger and stronger as the days rolled by, as did its sadistic desire to intimidate terrorize and frighten. Ultimately, he and fellow investigator Michael Hallowell visited 42 Lock Street for seven months. 
quite surprisingly, the activity, from what can be determined, ultimately fizzled out when the family, upon the recommendation of the investigators, took to turning their electricity off at night. Presumably without an active power source to feed it, the happenings faded away. Throughout, the two investigators had very little idea as to what Marianne, Mark and Robert were experiencing. All they could say was that it was very real, which, given the nature of the activity reported, is naturally difficult to digest. And yet, when reading Ritson's book on the South Shields poltergeist, it is clear that he and Hallowell, as well as the other investigators and helpers who were invited into the house, went to great lengths to establish the veracity of the happenings. Locked off cameras, motion alarms, activity logs, interviews with witnesses, photo and video evidence, even independent analysis by professionals, including the prestigious Society for Psychical Research. In addition to this, Ritson and Hallowell spoke with telephone engineers in an attempt to debunk the strange text messages received by both Marianne's mobile phone and the house's landline. The engineers were, so Ritson explained during a 2021 interview, bamboozled. Such telephonic interactions ought to have been impossible. In this way, Ritson and Hallowell ought to be commended for their dedication to documentation during this case. For certainly, such cannot be taken for granted when dealing with the paranormal, most especially when, as was the case in this instance, the terrorizing force attempts to destroy the very evidence that it creates. For, according to Ritson's book, photos and videos on Mark and Marianne's phones were regularly deleted, resulting in a militant S chain of command, whereby any evidence would be backed up and sent to the investigators as fast as was possible. Similarly, when the blood-like liquid appeared in the toilet instead of clean water, before there was any chance to collect evidence, it was supposedly flushed away, the poltergeist being the one to do so. Of course, such undoubtedly makes it easy for the sceptically minded to take pot shots at this case. Why wasn't a sample taken? Surely, if it were real, there would be laboratory evidence. And whilst this may be a fair statement, it is also necessary to consider not merely the exceptional nature of what is being proposed, but also how the family were just trying to live their lives. This was not a science experiment for them, but rather a very frightening, very bewildering time in their lives that they were no doubt pleased to put behind them. Speaking in 2021, Darren Ritson has addressed some of these concerns, stating that, in hindsight, there are many things he would have done differently. For example, in regards to his claim of urine-smelling liquid manifesting on the carpet of Robert's bedroom, he wishes he had thought to take a sample. In the moment, in the midst of such chaos, he simply didn't think to do so. Regardless of the should-have, would-haves, there is still much worthy of praise in the South Shields case. Perhaps some of the best evidence can be said to be that which correlates with other alleged instances of poltergeist activity. After all, it can be said to be distinctly bizarre that there are traits that appear time and time again in poltergeist cases. For example, coins are said to have appeared randomly about Marianne and Mark's house. Such fascination with coins, even to the extent that they appear as if out from thin air before dropping to the floor, is something which has been reported in numerous other cases, including the 1920s Puna poltergeist, as well as in the activity experienced by Eleonora Zugan. Between 1989 and 1991, there was also a well-documented case from South Wales of an allegedly responsive poltergeist that claimed apports of coins, including coins impacting on the floor and walls. By way of comparison, in the South Shields case, coins were at one point apporting so regularly that the investigators recalled making a joke in an attempt to soothe the couple that, if the poltergeist continued manifesting money at such a rate, they would soon be rich. Other similarities can be said to be the appearance of written messages. After all, not only did such messages appear on Little Robert's doodle boards and in disturbing text messages, they, so the family have claimed, also appeared on the walls of their home. On one occasion, Marianne is said to have found the ominous phrase RIP written on a wall in her son's bedroom in blue ballpoint pen. 
This, like the coins, relates to other historic cases of alleged poltergeist infestation, including the activity experienced by the Palai family in 1920s India, and also the chilling writing found scratched into a wall in the Great Amherst Mystery. In that instance, the focus of the activity was a young woman called Esther Cox. The words on her wall, arguably similar to the aggressive messages received by Marianne, said, Esther Cox, you are mine to kill. And so, in many ways, the South Shields poltergeist can be said to be a highly remarkable, highly believable case. Naturally, there will always be those who claim otherwise, but for those who are interested in examining paranormal phenomena with clear and willing eyes, this case does stand apart, and might very well represent one of the most important instances of poltergeist activity thus reported in the 21st century. It is well documented, and provides much insight into the behaviour of the unseen force which we regard as the poltergeist. And yet, the South Shields case, for all of its believability, can also be said to leave many unanswered questions. Chief amongst them, what caused it all to happen in the first place? Oftentimes, poltergeists, as opposed to regular, run-of-the-mill spirits of the dead, seem to haunt people instead of places. Often, these people are adolescent girls. Such was certainly the case with the before-mentioned Eleonora Zugan and also in other popular stories such as the Enfield Poltergeist of the 1970s. In South Shields, the only young person was three-year-old Robert. And while certainly he may have been the focus, with his imaginary friend Sammy being a good candidate for the supernatural mayhem, by the end of the experience, the investigators were much more convinced that adult Mark was the focus of the activity. Why, we can only speculate. Likewise, the full reason behind why the activity stopped remains a mystery. And so, as is often the case with the paranormal, there are more questions than answers. What can be said, though, is that in the mind of Darren Ritson, at least, something strange really did happen in the South Shields house. He just cannot say what. Even 15 years later, he does not have an explanation. He merely knows that it happened, and that it affected him, scared him, and will continue to affect and scare him for the rest of his life. After all, some things simply cannot be forgotten. The activity was, in his words, a contagion, some manner of paranormal infection that continues to plague households to this day, perhaps not publicised, perhaps suffered in silence, but most certainly there unseen, unknown, largely disbelieved, and thus empowered to do as it pleases. It is not for no reason that Marianne, Mark, and Robert are pseudonyms. They wish it had never happened. And so likewise, perhaps you ought to wish that it never happens to you. Thank you for watching, I truly hope you enjoyed this video. If you did and would like more of the paranormal, please like and subscribe, being sure to click the bell icon to receive all notifications. And if you would like to learn more about this case, for there is much more to learn, I strongly recommend reading Darren Ritson's book. I have included a link to it in the description. Otherwise, if you cannot wait until my next video, why not watch the one suggested on screen now? Thank you again. Until next time.